Welcome. This is a January 23rd Jail and Zones production user call. We have Goran, Dan, Jan, Doug, Chris, and myself, Michael. We've gone through a few topics already. And Doug, I just wanted to pick up where we left off last time, which was I just tried applying your differential for nine the 9P client. And it did reasonably well on 14, but I'm curious, have you had a moment to jot down any docs related to that? And just how big a build does it need? A full build world or just kernel or user select user space components or what? And I'm referring to this differential. So let's see from, from memory, um, that certainly needs a kernel. I think that the stock beehive already has enough support. Um, so basically the stock beehive, I didn't modify it at all. Um, I, it was already set up to work with, with Linux 9P worked perfectly for, for this. Um, for documentation, I did write a man page, which is fairly extensive, um, and covers things like how you set it up for, for, um, root mounts and, and, and stuff like this. Oh, excellent. Uh, I'm always I'm always willing to accept suggestions on my documentation because I'm a programmer and not a writer. Uh, but yeah, there is some there is a, a reasonably detailed man page there, um, which yeah. So, um, in terms of what what's next, I need to go back to the diff. I need to rebase it. I need to go through the um, comments. Take at least one more pass through the comments and fix any nits that people have asked for. And then I can land it into parent. I'm not in any great rush to merge it to 14, but I think it will be a good addition to 14 at some point in the life cycle. Does anyone off the tops of their head remember what the schedule for 14.1 is? Because I think that would be a good ship vehicle for this. I can look it up. I recall Colin early on saying January because of the issues when 14 skidded to the ground, but uh, that's worth revisiting. Yeah, uh, I thought he was focused on 13.3 first. Correct, I don't correct. Know. So that, that was a later discussion. Uh, yeah. Dan is curious about what is 9P. Maybe you can give the pitch, I can give mine. Okay, so... Um, to give a bit of background, um, a popular, well, with all hypervisors, to provide services from the hypervisor into the guest operating system, you either use emulation or you use some kind of fast path. And in the past, there have been fast paths for um, Zen. Um, the, the Linux KVM folk came up with a different thing called Vert.io, and it use, you we use it um, in Beehive to, to get you know, like console services, um, network services, things like that. So 9P background is not new. It's um, the file system from Plan 9. Um, it's an interesting small-scale network file system. So what the KVM people did was they added a new transport for 9P to move data over the Vert.io bus instead of across you know ip networks and that gives um, a reasonably secure i won't say it's high performance but it's a short path to between the the um hypervisor which for us would be, be the beehive kind of front end tool and the guest of op guest um operating system and you know i've used it to mount local directories into the client into the into the guest i've used it for um having the guest use a root file system that's just a directory on the on the host and it's kind of convenient so that's that's what 9pfs in this context is i absolutely did not add the tcp ip transport for traditional 9p does that answer the question But yeah. given that uh, 9P works over any uh, bidirectional stream, 
which is sufficiently reliable, it wouldn't be that much to add a network with reconnect to word. Oh yeah, it, it's not, I don't think it's a big piece of work. I just don't have a use case for it locally. Um, literally, uh, the only reason I did this because I was doing some kernel development and I wanted to shorten the turnaround time for iterating on the stuff I was working on. And MFS didn't work for you because it didn't provide the right semantics or just because it was uh, too annoying to set up? Uh, provision. You know, I've, I've done NFS, um, that kind of NFS development in the, in the past. The It always ends up being uh, a kind of boot over the network thing, which tends to have turnaround times of, in minutes, whereas this solution gives me turnaround times in seconds. I can... I can um, yeah, 30 seconds perhaps to to set up a, a new root fs using package base 10 seconds to boot it um and, so yeah uh, I, i've done i the nfs would have worked i i wanted to try this to see if it would be better and for me it was and unlike um shared block storage you don't have to decide which side gets to mount the time right yeah so literally the the uh, the beehive command line you give it the path name for a local directory and the name of the share that that's exposed to the to the guest and the guest mount can mount that share they can't escape from it and just from the field Antrenig, i know you spun up 9p with a linux guest this last week perhaps and the performance was quite good would you say If your audio is treating you well, you're muted, but anyway. Uh, and then, Jan, you've got some questions about, for example, has the file handle vnode mapping been fixed? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Um, yeah, so let's let's just add a little context. The 9P protocol is, is open, closed semantic space. So you open a file, you get a handle to the open file. You do your I/O on that handle, then you close the file. Um, but <clears throat> whereas the FreeBSD kernel VFS interface is essentially inode based, we we uh, to open a file, we find the inode, and then we maybe we mark it as open. But look, anybody can be sharing that inode based. Uh, uh, anybody yep. that's that's got an open file descriptor, so. It's with BFS in its current form, it's very hard to get the, the POSIX semantics on a, a file system like 9P, which has this open close thing, because okay. you have to there's there's you have to use heuristics to map an inode based request or a vnode based request to the right file handle. I put in some so some heuristics i just just want to complete my thought yeah, let him finish. before it before falls out um i made some heuristics that would map a particular user to the same file handle that, that to a file handle that had been opened by that user and it kind of nearly works but it fails when a process does privilege lowering so you execute as root do some setup and then privilege lower to an unprivileged user then the mapping breaks and it doesn't really work very well. I kind of skated around that by just using tempfs for all of the places where that mattered. Um, I did. I have got a couple of patches for lib9p which improve it, but not completely. So uh, do you happen to know which? Sorry, do you happen to know which state uh, is tied to the handle? So probably the, so you said the opening user. What about yep. uh, the read write exec permissions uh, for each one so of we those? Do, um, we do the okay. So we do we do the permission check on open, like everyone, like all the file systems in the kernel do this, and then we get we provide those creds to the nine p server. So it will also do print checks, I think. 
think I'm right in this, on the on the host. And it gives us a handle back and we associate that with with that UID. Um, and then the next time we do an IO, we get the vnode, we've got the creds, and we kind of map it to to the ID, hopefully to the file handle that we had before. Um, where it fails is with, with privilege lowering, um, we can the kernel will be using the same file descriptor table in the in the load situation. So but we no longer have an open file handle with that particular cred. Oh. You can say we, we so we, we open the file with cred UID zero and lower it to um, cred UID ten thousand or something. Um, and then we try and use that file handle, but we we the Vino doesn't the Vino to file handle mapping Vino plus UID to file handle mapping isn't there? It's really hard. Um, so I can't kind of what I have to. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I the kind of want to fix DFS, at but it's open hard. time. You yeah, I mean, it, to you your, have, uh, so you can. There's nearly a place for this. I think there's there's a field in the file handle. The, in the file descriptor struct that allows you to store some state. And this is used by DevFS. Um, so you could potentially keep the keep the uh, 9p handle in that place. But then you have to make sure that opens and closes match up correctly. Um, there, there, I think that would be a, that would be tricky. I so you would have could, to have another place where you need atomic reference counting. Yeah, or well, we kind of already do, but I mean the existing reference counting on file descriptors would would work. So the last close would be able to potentially yeah. um, clean things up. Um, I don't feel confident in my abilities to do this correctly. I could make a a prototype of it. And then spend months in code review <laughs> because yeah. I feel like somebody, somebody that actually is being paid to do VFS. We have a couple of those folk, uh, probably not on this call. They should be the ones to to say whether or not this is the right approach. Because you know what I think and what is actually real are two different things. Does that make sense? Well, thank you for that update. Another question. When you mentioned vert IO, it became apparent to me what it was for, because I remember seeing that with Beehive configuration. Just to yeah. clear up any uh, confusions, we have a similar concept called uh, vert IO vert FS, virtual, so vert yes. IO files of them, which is different that basically instead of tunneling the 9P protocol over uh, vert IO ring buffers, it tunnels the um, Fuse protocol, and to make matters even more interesting, for efficient MMAP, there's an optional extension for that, which then uses shared uh, memory buffers between uh, the server and guest. So yeah, and then oh, that case, okay. you're t very tightly integrated because you can have a shared writable mapping between that. Um, yeah. If it's a user space daemon, then okay, maybe that's fine, um, which does the serving. If it's in kernel, uh, I want to run away. <laughs> yeah, typically, I think typically the the um, server end is in user land. It will be QMU or our own beehive, which is roughly equivalent. I mean, it would be nice to have vert, vert FS or whatever it's called, um, yeah. because this is the native. Uh, this is Hyper-V. Hyper-V supports this native is what I'm trying to say. So uh, we could have better guests inside of Hyper-V if we had this. Not just that, it would uh, remove the mismatch of semantics between uh, 9P, which mm. was designed for Plan 9 and yeah, yeah. Um, didn't care that much about the last bit of efficiency and the common first generation Unix point of view of uh, mm. everyone else who survived, like Linux and FreeBSD, uh, because the but, fuse protocol kind, kind of matches the common system calls one by so one. Here's, here's the thing. Um, 
any implementation that does this is still going to, on the host, is still going to have to be opening and closing files and trying to, to map protocol requests coming yes from the guest no. to open files. They could be yes no. reopening all the time. Yeah, I guess. No, you, you uh, could... if it's privileged, it could keep a cache and use the mm -hmm. FH open system call uh, oh, to yeah. open the, the files by handle instead of by path. Yeah. yeah. Does that still but work? <laughs> I, um, supposedly, if you're privileged, because part of the NFS locking code uh, for the NFS well, lock and so on, I think I have to use it. Used to, used to until I rewrote it. Uh, oh. Months, how long ago? I, so the, the user space lock D did this and used FH open, but I had a contract with Isilon back in the day to, to write a kernel space lock D. So that's no longer necessary. So probably that function, that system call doesn't get used very often these days. It might Interesting. Be. I mean, it's still a good enough idea, I guess. Is it maybe used in F check somewhere, FS check to follow? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, reference yeah. or something? Yeah. I mean, equally, you could write a cache of, you could open everything as root and do manual proof checks in, the, um, in the, the host. There is something and quite interesting okay. to do that. It was written for the Ganesha uh, NFS server, which mm -hmm. implements the accidental feature previous DLX, uh, which is that on Linux, unlike uh, on FreeBSD, the kernel doesn't really know the difference between a process and a thread. So uh, on Linux, it's possible for a single thread to drop its effective user ID before oh. opening a oh. file. <laughs> and there's a yeah, um, yeah that, that causes all kinds of real world problems. But for a user space NFS server, it's a blessing because you can have a server with a thread which drops privileges and then does the atomic open correctly instead of trying to do access uh, to emulate an atomic uh, verify privileges and open. And there's a kernel module from them, even if the Ganesha demon, I think, has been removed, the kernel module is still there, and it's quite small to uh, expose the same feature with, with uh, system calls so that you can, uh, as long as you're allowed to, uh, open as, basically, open as this user. Mm. So that you... Anyway, I mean, this is a very interesting subject, but I feel like it's not really jail. It's, you are correct, but that, it was a pickup... <laughs> It was a segue yeah, from no, last time we had you. Um, and I'd love to hit you with one very, very brief question, which is okay. way hypothetically, what would a native ZFS BERT IO look like to just simply pass a, a data set through to a guest for the root file mm. system and hopefully safely, et cetera? Mm. I don't know, to okay. be honest. I, um, I wouldn't do that. I would just, at best I would use as as evolve, but sharing sharing is you're essentially basically it's roughly equivalent to having some kind of network block store and trying to mount it twice on two different posts. That, um, whenever that this is was not seriously, quite as bad. I'm uh, being pessimistic, but yeah, it would be hard. So whenever this was seriously considered, the idea was that you want to have the ZFX. ZFS experience as a user, uh, mm -hmm. so that you can have snapshot management, manage properties, create child data set. So I think mm -hmm. it would be a kind of fuse with extra messages mm -hmm. to do ZFS data set and potentially pool management. So it would still look like just a very VFS focused file system pass through and then the ZFS meta commands on top of that interesting i'm fine if it doesn't look like zfs to the guest i just want you know control from the host and the shortest distance between the host file system and the guest in a safe approach of course <laughs> if it's uh, possible. that's what you get with the with the 9p thing okay, so fair enough. i mean I, I i use zfs exclusively for for this and you know but it, it's just a directory with files in it by the time perfect i'm actually using it uh, and then finally, is there reason to pursue the the exact uh, vert IOFS or is it it's uh, vert FS or is that dependence on fuse not in our best interest? It basically uh, is nine p that um, I think it, approach. 
it would be useful for so Podman wants to move away from using 9P for the uh, backtrack a little bit. Podman has this feature so that you can, if you're running on uh, Mac OS or Windows or whatever, then you can create um, a QMU virtual, virtual machine, which runs Linux. You do your Podman things inside of, uh, inside of that and talk to it from the, from the host. And it looks like you're doing containers on your, on your laptop and you're kind of doing them in. So, um, David Chisnell wrote um, some stuff to allow that virtual machine to be actually be a FreeBSD virtual machine. So you doing doing FreeBSD containers on your laptop, which is kind of cool. But um, for some reason he had so there was some some stuff. Oh, that's right. He he couldn't make that work using the mac os um built-in hypervisor which required but but iofs or, or whatever that thing is called that okay. you'd have to check with david but i think that was the the blocker that he had got it thank you so if that's everything on that topic uh jamie anything in jln to report or questions for the group um, two things. One is this will be my last time on the call for some months because tax season is ramping up and I become busy. Understood. So I will Sorry still to hear try that. to things out, but not be able to participate. And second, I'm actually starting coding for jail descriptors and I've run into some questions on how we want to go about some things mostly uh, security and lifetime questions for example in security the thing i ran into was say jail attach it does a security check for jail attach permission which like most security checks is if you have root you can do it or if you've been particularly given the permission you can do it or if the uh, switch has been hit that root isn't good enough, then you have to have the the uh, permission for it. And the idea behind, oh, an idea behind jail descriptors is if you have the descriptor, you can do the thing. But if it doesn't take any special security to get a descriptor, which I'm thinking you should be able to get one from jail get, and it doesn't take any special security to use a descriptor for something like setting or removing a jail, then at what, you know, where do you insert the part that says regular users can't do this? My assumption would be that the one creating the jail gets the uh, fully capable descriptor, and then you could use the capsicum system calls to restrict that. And upon anyone holding such a file descriptor to not leak it to any unprivileged process. So set it to uh, close on exec if, and uh, don't, uh, yeah, don't send it to the wrong process. So that becomes a, uh, an attribute of the descriptor then. So there can be different descriptors with different permissions attached to um, With yeah. capsicum at least, so yes. The, that, the that capsicum is always on in the kernel, basically. So, and you don't have to be uh, in the capsicum sandbox to put the capsicum restrictions on a file descriptor to apply. So, if you make the functionality available via iOctodes uh, on the file descriptor, uh, capsicum can already be used to uh, filter out which iOctodes are allowed on this basically capsicum wrapped file descriptor, um, which would then allow basically to, for every function exposed via this file descriptor to either pass it on or not. So for example, to just check if the jail is still alive or dying and get notified when its state has changed, it doesn't have to be a descriptor which can do anything dangerous like change a variable. So it just makes sense to have a header where the right uh, definition is basically in the header so that 
in sync with the kernel operations, which just says, I want to preserve these I octals for reading stuff this generation of the user land knows about, then you could just do that. So we can yes. depend on capsicum always being there? It isn't generic. I don't think, I don't know if you can even remove it anymore. Okay. Because a bunch of tools in user uh, in base, I think, will just no longer work because if they can't lock themselves into a sandbox, it may be that they're still support, all surrounded by if diffs, but I'm not certain that they are. Can anyone think um, of examples there? That's a very good point. Commands which are uh, sandboxed, uh, like TCP dump, for example, uh, it opens the the BPF descriptor uh, sets it up, and then before it looks on the at the first packet, uh, it does uh, lock itself inside of Capsica on sandboxing. Okay. Uh, it could be that it's cool. also rounded by if devs, uh, and yeah. so that all of the safety falls away if you don't use it, and then it would be a problem. Uh, or it could be that uh, you reopen the descriptor read only. And then it's read write permission. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's true. I could do it with uh, with tacking things on to the uh, file descriptor mode. Yeah, that would be the already considering for uh, the idea of a descriptor that when you close it kills the jail. Yeah. No, not if you close it. If the last reference gets dropped. Well, so yeah. Here, right. You have to be it's very careful. With, uh, about the difference between uh, the file descriptor number used in the system call from user space, the file descriptor, and then the file opening. And it's if the and then only if the last reference to that gets dropped, uh, you actually garbage collect. This is also how process descriptors uh, work. Right. Only when the last, so if you have a non-detached process descriptor, uh, the process isn't, killed until the last open reference to that file descriptor gets dropped. There's one thing I was thinking of, of a difference between process descriptors and jail descriptors is there is only ever one process descriptor per process. It can get duped and, you know, so there can be multiple views on it, but it really only ever becomes the one descriptor. And so if if you set your descriptor into daemon mode so it doesn't drop, then you know that process is no longer controlled by its descriptor. And you only get the descriptor through PD fork. So you have to yes. do a special fork to get a descriptor. But with jails, I'm thinking I, I don't want that. I would like to be able to get a descriptor for a jail that you did not create. Now maybe according there is to your current privileges. I'm sorry, what was that? According to your current privileges, so yes, right. If you if you the other problem is if you make it completely unprivileged, someone could by accident hold at least a readable file descriptor, which could then block jail destruction until who you find out where this file descriptor ended up in, uh, reprocess inheritances later or something. Um, yes, well, yeah, generally that's under the case so, of, yeah, you don't want to lose track of these things. Um, uh, that does That is the other question, is the lifetime question. The other alternative would be to have to support anything revoke-like. Normally revoke is done on paths, not on file descriptors. But if you have uh, basically kill this jail and break the uh, existing file descriptors and put them into the revoked state, so that they would immediately return an IO error on any system call on them. That could work. So that you can basically pour, similar to a forced unmount. Yeah. Because it's really annoying when you have a state where just going from adding a force flag or something doesn't unstick the system if it's hung in the state because you really don't want to add new states where you can force someone to reboot the host because they don't know uh, the right 20 steps to uh, debug the problem and find the culprit. Yeah. 
Now, now that gets to the lifetime question, Please. which is, you know, do we want these descriptors to hold jails open? Do we just want them to hold them existing, but in the dying state? I notice with process descriptors that uh, the descriptors themselves can exist with a unreaped process, so zombie process. But, uh, you know, there's also possible that we could have the descriptors exist without a jail, with nothing but a uh, cached JID saying, here's the jail that used to exist when it, uh, before it goes away. What there, about the jail properties? What about the jail what? Jail properties stored in the kernel, uh, like a loud mount or something. Well, yes. You, um, once the jail goes away, you would not be able to see what those properties were. But then, once a jail goes away, it is generally the case that it is in some state of being destroyed. And mm -hmm. so certain properties may not be valid anyway. Or even yeah. if valid, may not be meaningful. What so I was worried about, worried about is, let's say you need the jail name or the jail host name or something like that. Uh, to basically map the descriptor back to your orchestrator state, something like Nomad or something where it really doesn't just want to know the jail ID, but the handle it assigned with the UUID or something. Okay, so yes, that's that then opens up the problem if you if you uh, show the jail, keep the jail name in the descriptor of a destroyed jail, does that mean you can't create a new jail with that jail name until you let go of that descriptor? Not if you unlink it from the tree structure or list or whatever is used to hold the reservation and still keep a reference, but that makes things a bit more complicated to track lifetimes. Yes. Or so, yeah, you that's... just say um, it can be broken if you do it and then you lose state, but it has to be user space initiating this breakage. So basically you get told this jail wants to die. You give it, give all the ones holding the file descriptor a chance to break up, process the event and close the descriptor and then everything happens normally. And if it doesn't happen, then it can, uh, Someone else can get, go around and um, just break the association and then you lose state. This may be good enough and less lifetimes to track. But I don't know what's the optimal choice there. Okay. So I may end up doing it one way and then changing based on feedback as we see what works here. But yeah, and and I, I will look into the uh, capsicum thing, but yes, I see so much if-def capabilities in kernel code that makes me think the idea of running the kernel without capsicum, even if not in generic, is still a consideration I need to make. So- I think you okay. can. Point of order, I thought the uh, Capsicum uh, build option went away recently because I've been chasing build options for years. Uh, do look into that because that might be all on its way out. So that, check that and out. The other thing is uh, if at least anything uh, mutating the system state is put uh, behind this file descriptor has to be writable, you have at least the basic safety mechanism there. And then yeah, that's true. the fine granular you're only to change jail variables, but not attach, or you're allowed to attach, but not uh, change the configuration, then that is only behind Capsicum, which, yeah, at that point, I would say, don't strip down your host kernel too much. <laughs> if you want these things. Okay. Here's an RFC on removing Capsicum from 14x, so I and I know it's been throwing warnings like, "Hey, that's no longer valid." When I'm tinkering with build options, just saying. I hope that helps. <clears throat> okay, so, so without capsicum, without Casper, so is the define for capabilities different than the com 
defines for capsicum? I thought they were kind of the same no. thing. Capsicum implies capabilities. Okay. Because without it, you can't do it. Right. Well, anyway, those they are they are um, still only partially formed questions I have because I only have partially formed code. Basically, right now I have code that does not do any uh, K info KQ stuff, does not do any of that permission checking, and only exists in that uh, a descriptor can be generated and then can be used in place of a JID. But, you know, obviously we want much more than that. So I will be uh, soon putting it into differential and I'll uh, let the differential link, link out. And then you'll have about two and a half months of talking behind my back about me <laughs> before I will be in on calls again. Understood. Uh, Doug, any observations or questions? And others, Chris, others, I know you've been looking under the hood on some of these technologies, Goran. So I wanted to say from an OCI point of view, I tend to just rely on the persist property because um, the OCI runtime runs in steps. So run the create and that process will eventually exit after it starts the gel. So there's nobody to hold that file descriptor. So I probably wouldn't use this. I guess you could probably manage to get the file, file descriptor from the runtime into the monitoring daemon which for us is common. Okay. So basically, Conmon observes the the container via its um, owning PID, which is an, an ideal mapping for for jail based things. And then when the when the container PID exits, it tells the runtime to kill it. At which point. I reset the persist flag and let it die. So as long as you main con maintain control over the jail lifetime this way, then you then you mm. do not have a need yeah. to view the think... jail lifetime through something like KQ. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Godspeed, Jamie. This is exciting. I look forward yeah, well, to that review, well, and uh, I'm you've got some talented eyes on it. Yes, and I hope to have actual real code. I want to add a little more before I release it, but not too much more. It'll definitely be a partly done thing before the differential exists. Let us know how we can help. All right. Other topics we had... I'll just maybe do a little lightning round here. Uh, Goron's gone down some rabbit holes, not all of which are jail specific, but uh, if anything, maybe in case you missed it, Goron added SIG info control T support to the find command. Uh, has that landed? Probably lost. Do we still have Goron? Yeah, he's on. You're muted. Go ahead and maybe yeah, talk sorry. about that. Problems with the buttons. Uh, yeah, it landed and it worked fine. It's um, uh, it has one quirky addition, and that is a counter that shows you how many files have been processed. So that you kind of have a feeling is it working something and how fast is it working? So it, it's not only signal, but I try to tell something to the end user because sometimes we would have to search through a data set, which is huge. And you don't know if a process is stuck or it's just not finding anything. 
<laughs> oh, I see. Does file size play a role? No, I don't think it plays a role because it's working on a file names usually. Okay. I think there are some fine uh, arguments that are going to make it peek into a file, but usually not. Okay. Any questions for Goran related to that? I thought it was kind of a cool idea. And actually, it was there was a moment the day he announced it, I could have used it earlier that day. So I'm I'm excited. <laughs> and I, I don't know if KeyCat has anything to do with uh, jail, but I'm I'm glad you're taking a look at that. It's a rather powerful tool, and he's looking at the port and updating, as I recall. Yeah, it's a well electronic schemas, PCBs, and so on. Stuff. So I want to build something. Uh, I mean, it's not a secret. It's always the audio with me. But, uh, <laughs> I want to build something new and uh, hopefully give it to the world in a permissive license. Nice. Goran's fuzz box, perhaps. Yeah. And finally, do you think you found a bug in libif config and vnet? Well, <laughs> I am not sure yet is it my code or i stumbled upon a bug because uh printf here and there tells me that uh leave if config created a pair but somehow the rest of the code doesn't pick it up and i don't see that interface so when i isolate just the codes that I use in a jail utility, well, in my patch on it, uh, everything works. So for now, it's magical. Ideally, I will, well, at least narrow down where the bug is, hopefully this weekend, because, well, the weekends are when I have time. Cool. Okay, well, if you have something reproducible, definitely run it by the group create a PR, whatever, whatever you think is appropriate. So, uh, uh, just one question. Isn't libif config private to a uh, BIF config command and not even installed as a static library, let alone a dynamic library? But... Yes and no. It's, um, um, it is private, but not only to if config. You can use it, and there, uh, if you grab around uh, the code, you will see usages of it outside of if config. Okay, I thought that maybe the yeah, other way um, the cloning yeah. functionality is just an ioctal on a socket. So you can create any type of socket, even a unique socket. It doesn't have to be an IP socket. And then you can use the clone tool uh, on it uh, and create it. And you get the, you can pass in a requested interface name and you get the interface name you actually gotten back in the reply. So you basically get, have two uh, EF non size. So 16 byte large swings in there, the struct and, um, uh, oh wait, yeah, you put in the cloner and the desired interface name and you get back the created interface name, so yeah. I mean, I know how to, well, work around it. It's not a problem, but I think that library was created for a reason and I, think if it has a bug, I'd rather fix it. And now that I of think of it, I think its API is too narrow to support everything that ifconfig does. So I'm not sure that the ifconfig binary is using the lib ifconfig. Uh, I think it does uh, for that. Uh, I've checked at least that it does to list the cloners. And I think also to set up the iOctal that does it. Uh, but the, in 13.2 and newer, the functionality is also exposed via Netlink if you want to go down that route. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was going to suggest Netlink as perhaps a 
a more supportable interface. I'm not sure whether libif config is intended to be used outside of the core build. There you have uh, sure. you, you profit from the stability guarantees Linux ma makes to user space interfaces <laughs> because to be <laughs> compatible, you have to support everything they do. And that means yeah. you can't break things so that you would go through net link route and then um, new link. And what's a bit confusing, I went down that route myself if, a few weeks ago, is that most of the netlink documentation, anything Linux specific, tells you that the return value you get back from adding an interface or a route is an opaque blob. But in reality, for interface creation on both Linux and PSD, you, the opaque block uh, just happens to contain two uh, netlink attributes which carry the interface in, uh, index and name. And unless you know that there's no completely race free way to do that, I wrote code to match this created interface, use the FreeBSD specific extension to match the offer process ID against my own, but what if I get the multicast message dropped and then how do I resynchronize on that? Well, it turns out you don't have to. Linux does the same and on Linux, the IP2 command uh, also uses this. Uh, it's just not do documented any place I found except after the fact in the FreeBSD netlink route man patch. I'm curious as to whether or not any of the libraries that people have written on top of Netlink, there's a Go standard library for it uh, somewhere. There's a Rust library. I wonder if they depend on this feature, this undocumented I know feature. that the Linux IP2 command does. Right. I found that code. At that point, I was content that, yes, I understand this little half sentence in the main page correctly. Uh, but yeah. Mm -mm. It's some kind of identifier you can use to find the route or interface again. Yeah, in this case, it's the interface and ID and name. Interesting. Another place where a descriptor-based API would be uh, preferable, but it's not the way the world is moving right now. Well, NetLink is interesting enough to at least look into it. Now I have a excuse or a reason to actually do it. Cool. Um, I have a bit of example code I can throw in your direction, but it's just work in progress code I wrote to understand how to use it and not claiming that it's anything adiomatic for it. You know where to so find as, him. As, as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware, since fourteen, uh, since before fourteen branched, um, if config by default uses Netlink for uh, all of its work. In uh, Trasa, I found it using iOctodes for interface creation. Okay, the one place where you have to use Netlink for interface cloning in FreeBSD fourteen is if Atomically, as part of cloning a VLAN interface, you would want to set the ether type uh, and the VLAN ID instead of doing it after the fact. Because unlike the IOCTL, the uh, Netlink create interface matches which can carry additional configuration. Annoyingly, what they haven't implemented, neither in Linux nor in FreeBSD, is to set the initial interface name. <laughs> so, yeah. You can only create it using cloner plus index or uh, let the kernel pick and then rename. You can't just say, I want you to clone the interface under this name in a single uh, either normal system call or netlink message. Uh, because of that, there's always a little moment where the interface has been created, but not yet renamed if you want to have a renamed interface. And with the given system calls, there's no way to make that atomic, as far as I've found out. Anything else on that topic? Dan L, you've been jailing up a storm with Greylog, OpenSearch, and MongoDB. Any wisdom to share related to that? 
all I want to share is that uh, I've long held that software projects need to create simple, basic default configurations that allow the user to get something running. A lot of projects go into a lot of detail in the documentation, but don't provide a single working example. And if your user has to spend hours trying to get something to work and just getting error messages that don't make any sense because you haven't got anything to work yet, you're going to lose users because they give up in frustration and go somewhere else. You mean like I'm out buffer sure for? I've got access to people that know more. But if I didn't, I'd be done already. I think my so, SQL called that the 15 minute rule. If you can't just get it up and running as a sort of simple example in 15 minutes, you've, you've failed. Yep. That, that's a decent length of time. And I mean, we, we've all had success with software where we've got it in and running and installed and it runs right out of the box. And any other things that you need to do take effort, but just a simple little example. Yep. Just, just a working example. Show me what works, and then I can start modifying it to my own needs. Amen. But I've spent five hours trying to get open search and gray log working with each other. You so won't get that five hours done back great job unless on you learn something really cool. Go ahead. They've done a great job on documentation. But as a novice, you can't see how to fit that all together. Got it. At least I can. They don't have any practical examples that work. There's too many moving parts. Understood. Uh, Jan, while we have the tail end of Jamie before his adventures, it sounds like you'd like to perhaps broadside us all with a new jail hooks proposal. Is that you typing there? Yes, that's me. Um, Any so other the, topics uh, before we jump into that, or uh, shall we let her rip? Let her rip. So uh, using the base system tools without using any of the more complex jail managers right now uh, to start, all you can do with a jail is write down its configuration, start or stop it. Uh, oftentimes the services you want to basically encapsulate within the jail need a richer interface than just starting or stopping them. For example, you probably don't want to have your, uh, uh, let's say your, um, LDAP service or whatever come up with the default password and auto register itself uh, with let's encrypt so that all the world knows its uh, URL and uh, knows that it's this kind of service and it runs with a default password until you figure out what it is. By that time, probably a half a dozen bots have already thought about control of your service. So uh, stuff like that. Um, so uh, it would be very nice to have um, an interface to which is richer, which you can extend, for example, to set the initial uh, administrator password of a web service to uh, have itself update, um, to attach some kind of host resource to it or something. And like everything in jail.com, the natural way to follow this design of jail.conf is to use shell scripting for it. And if you want to have a better scripting interface, well, then you just write a shell script or in some other language and exec from it into the shell into it. And for that to work uh, reliably and as if you run the command directly, uh, the jail command can't stay in the way because that would get in the way of signal delivery. So the jail command has to exec and get out of the way thereby. Um, but before it can do that, because uh, you don't want everyone reinventing the wheel, 
it would be useful if you could use gel.conf per hook to uh, basically set up the process state as far as it can be from the outside. So apply resource limits, set a, maybe a t alarm timeout for the timeout, uh, redirect files um, attached to the jail, and then you exec. Um, in my opinion, it would also be useful if it could uh, double fork a helper, which will, will then be also out of the way to just read uh, logging messages from um, some kind of file descriptor. And because uh, I found it very painful in 14.0 as it is right now, to basically have to write shell code to export every uh, jail verbal or property I want to have available again in an export directive. Um, I would like to see the option to basically have a block in there so that uh, we can just say, I want to have variables matching this pattern exported. I want to have variables matching this pattern hidden where hiding a variable takes priority. And all the variables match should be prefixed with this string. Um, so that you don't collide with other things. For example, put it on everything under a jail underscore prefix and just export everything except the password variable or something to this hook. Um, yes. And then you could have a nice interface uh, which then higher level tools could uh, target and the jail.conf would be the common interface point. But for example, um, jail manager like um, Antonix um, jailer could just generate this hook to interface with it. And it wouldn't even have to be incompatible with another jail manager and you could even have them in be included from a directory containing files or snippets. And the syntax I imagine would look, uh, yeah, that something like this. And it would be a lot easier if we could also change it so that you could expand multi-valued variables in gel.conf uh, and just have them be joined by new lines. That would simplify things. So uh, can I take the screen for a second? Sure. So can you see my screen? Yes, sir. So uh, I may have gone a bit overboard, but the idea would be that we have a new um, basically block we can put inside the jail definition. Uh, for example, here console would be the canonical one, which is what JXEC does by default. But uh, then you can see if it's to be jailed or not. The state you want the jail to be in. So absent means it must be absent. Existence, it already has to exist. Create, create it on demand. Remove, stop it on demand. Ignore, it doesn't matter. Uh, to really set the primary user and group, append to the list of groups, uh, change the work directory once in the proper execution environment, maybe change root yourself, apply a bunch of resource limits, basically everything the limits command can do. Uh, then filter the variables or set additional ones. Here the idea is that you can even have multiple export or hide patterns is multi-valued and then the prefix is single valued for set the value is would be uh, multi-valued but then they would get joined again uh, using new lines uh, unset can just take multiple variable names to unset and yeah that's the craziest part about what you can 
would make sense for uh, I/O redirection. So this here the idea is that you create a read-only memfd, fill it with the static content, and then you don't have to stay around to feed it into a pipe. But it could still be read like a normal file. And for size things for size, you would put in a string which may not fit into a pipe buffer, but will fit into a memfd. I think that makes sense so that you can have basically the equivalent of a here doc. Just close this file descriptor, close from, then it's an initial extension, duplicate or move file descriptors around, or open a new file from a path with all the flags you can set because we don't, for example, if you need to hold a log file, you could say I have to have an exclusive lock on this file. And change the uh, owner and group of a file and the mode. Yeah. Here the idea would be that, yes, we have the logger command, but the logger command only works within the script. So if you want basically the gel.conf to say that how the output is to be captured, it makes sense to put it here in my opinion, then you just register all the source log properties for it with an option to prepend a prefix or append a suffix to each line. Uh, have it the log messages be printed to standard error and whether the syslog helper should be uh, jailed as well. If anything is to be jailed, the jail uh, uh, state defaults to create. If it's incompatible with that and the jail isn't running, it has to be a runtime. And then you can basically append or prepend to the a multi valued list of strings to the command line arguments. How many arguments you require, how many are allowed. If it's not set, it's infinite or zero. And then just the script as a single script to be given to uh, the NES edge. And if you want to run anything other than a shell script, you just have a trivial one-liner running exec. Similar to how you would do it before. I would like to clean that up and turn it into EBNF or something. I started doing that, but ran out of time. Is and this something you are experimenting with implementing or are you proposing it? No, to uh, but I'm proposing it to be implemented, but I'm willing to look at implementing it. Uh, that's uh, the good. Question, there's a lot there. <laughs> uh, a lot of it is just boilerplate. Um, and a lot of it is probably very tedious to figure out how to retrofit it to gel.com if you're not familiar with the code. But the nice thing is that basically every one of the, these blocks can be implemented one at a time. And even without any of one, it would already be useful. But every one of them makes it more useful. Hey, uh, Hi, Jan, no, with that, sorry, please go ahead. The note on the general syntax is, you know, the config file already has a general syntax of a keyword in front of curly brackets is a jail definition. That's why I, I put guess. a. But I, you I can't have that... spaces in jail, so there is no collision here. Though. Okay, so it's just the as long should as you be by that one hook thing. Then it changes it all. Okay. Then that's because you have basically token, and then a string. Okay. And in between there is white space, and you can't have white uh, space in a jail name as far as that. All right. So that shouldn't be a problem to keep unique. And I'm also more than willing to change the details. This is just what felt natural to me. It looks a bit too much like UCL probably, <laughs> but yeah. And some of the validation has to live outside of a parser because, uh, or in C snippets to be put in there by the Lexa. Uh, Lex uh, parser generator because yeah, there are some invariants you can't enforce just through syntax. 
Chris, you had an observation or question? Uh, I'm, I'm I'm just wondering. Um, we we previously were talking about um, finding uh, a format that works kind of like zones that would also cover Beehive, and I'm wondering how much how much of a gap is that? I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff there that I think can 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 also apply to a virtual machine running in Beehive because you can jail Beehive, I guess. Uh, of course, on the exactly. other hand, and then. You could have uh, things like logging in via CU to the primary serial console of the Beehive guest. It could be different from running a shell inside the Beehive jail. It could be different from, uh, I don't know, exposing a certain uh, CTL target to the Beehive system via VETA or SCSI or something. And a suitably complex jail con dot coms now that we can basically include them so that you don't have to write a unique one but you can reuse purposes uh, pieces of it what out what makes sense to basically have things to reuse and it's kind of a generic launch this uh, shell script in a certain uh, process state all of this is about setting up process state um in ways which may not be easy to do from a shell script, mm -hmm. or at least not in a true BinSH shell script, like setting a file descriptor to non-blocking. If you have to open a name pipe and don't know if there's a reader. For a lot of it, it's probably not used, but it's just all this, all of these work identical. So when you implement one, you only have to put a loop and an array of keywords around it. <laughs> These are basically just the flags you can give to the open system call. Well, it sounds like you're on your own at the very moment, but if you have questions yep. about the parser, then I'm, I'd hope Jamie's able to address so, those. Um, <laughs> then the idea is that, and that's, so because it may be that fish shell script, uh, because it could contain uh, expanded shell variables, which may contain some kind of secret configuration, let's say a private key is in there or something. Because of that, I think it would be best to just put the shell script also in a memory file descriptor and then instruct bin sh to just run badly bin sh slash dev slash fd something, uh, because you kind of want to keep the standard input around so that uh, you have the ability to prompt, for example, for a password and control the TTY, the STDN. Because of that, I can't just use uh, bin sh s and pipe the script in through uh, a standard input because that kind of breaks if you <laughs> do it like that. When, as soon as you redirect standard in, the shell starts changing its standard in and then reading the remaining code from there, which is not what you want. So um, you have to read it from a descriptor. The only downside is for that to work, it not block any of the free standard file descriptor, standard in, out, or error. You have to have the file descriptor file system mounted so that the interpreter can basically open a file descriptor by path again. But yeah. That's what it is. Do you need any opinions on general direction at this very moment, or are you still just fleshing this out? Uh, I'm fleshing this out. What I need is someone telling me if I'm completely off my uh, rocker or if this makes any sense or if this would be useful to anyone if implemented. It seems so, something that's um, not really part of jail definitions, but parallel to them, like it makes sense as its own utility but not really part of as it it's doesn't really have that much overlap with the rest of jail definition and jail creation and yes removal. and no not with j well, it has everything in common with jail definition but little with jail uh, starting and stopping so the, the overlap is that it kind of has to be able to on demand bring start up the jail if it's not already running so for example to change the 
administrative password of a web service, its internal database service may has to run, which runs inside the jail. So the jail has to be up and running so that I can mutate the database. And I may have to do something offline, which means I have to stop the jail to do it. Um, keep a, a long running process or is that just, you know, it, a one shot thing that it starts the jail and then it terminates? My idea is it's stuff which you can do, for example, at runtime, like add a user to my uh, managed service. Uh, which, but the idea would be that you use it for things which run to completion. But because uh, I want um, the TTY and um, signal delivery to work as expected and uh, to be truly out of the way, and I think I think everything I want can be done that way without adding too much complexity. Um, it, because the last thing this command would basically do is exec, so it just disappears once the state has been created and runs the hook script, which is nice because it means that we can um, just use it for anything because it disappears. It isn't a problem to use it for anything long running, but it wouldn't be the my expected use case. I assume the common way would be to just use it to do setup steps. So Daniel um, and Daniel, you're doing quite a bit in production. Does this feel right for lack of a better term? I mean, right to Dan's example on the you know, MongoDB and friends, uh, do you think having a, an, avenue to punching in little parameters inside the jail like a new password for a user might be helpful yeah i need to see more personally i um i think i i might have missed some and some of it's a little over my head uh but uh yeah i want to see some more examples for sure so another example would be to, let's say, take a dump of its uh, database or something. I, if you have a next cloud service, I want to take an SQL dump of the database, whatever it happens to be. And I just want it to be written to standard out. I don't care how it manages its uh, Postgres or MySQL server. I just want to take the database dump. And, and how is that different than how we would do it now with like... Um... Right now, um, there is no abstraction. You can do it all with JXEC, but you have to basically do it yourself and you can't abstract over it. There is no uh, natural point where there's an interface you can target. It's just, yeah, the mechanism exists, exists distributed all over the place. But they're not exposed through an interface which you can easily invoke. You have to reassemble it from first principles every time you use it. Right. I do I do a lot of that, like just scripting with So do I. It gets that... tedious. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Antranig, would something like Jailer have a, a hook into this? If your ISP well, is the, treating your audio the, well. Oh, no, it's fine. Finally, I have a proper internet connection. I feel like uh, I'm out of the, well, I feel like I'm out of Syria now. So actually, we had better uh, ISPs in Syria. The connection was awful, but the ISPs were nice, unlike in okay. here. Anyways, um, a jailer does have hooks uh, in the command line arguments um where you can say like run this, 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 and this, be like at these steps, and it will just work fine. Uh, but I'm thinking of integrating that into the uh, jailer file syntax as well, where you can have like specific um, uh, dtrace style hooks like jailer, uh, exec, pre-start, and like, uh, you know, one and two and three, and like just put things in there. So um, that that's also an idea that I've been wandering around. I have so a couple does of Dion's proposal mesh with that? 
Well, after Jan gave the idea three weeks ago, I started playing around with that as well. Okay. Um, the problem is that um, the jailer philosophy is that you know we we intervene at the setup and the migration, for example, destroy or rename, but we never play around at the start and stop. That's done by jail utility itself. Um, so I thought, hey, how can I use that without using that? It sounds kind of weird. Um, and the idea of hooks that I got is basically if you do jailer um, exec hook, jailer exec hook, some jail name and some hook name, the hooks details is saved as a variable inside of the jail conf of the uh, jail file itself. Basically, um, uh, yes, that's how the all the exec dot something hooks work. Yeah, uh, except that which... I have except that, yeah, I, I have it in like a random name. Like I have you know variable <laughs> apologies mm -hmm. variable named exec underscore add user. You know, and I just parse the file and grab all the exec underscores and I print it to the user. These are your hooks. Uh, and uh, choose whatever you want to run, and you run them. I just, you know, take the string I executed in a JEXEC. It's a very dirty hack, but um, uh, other maybe yes. cleaner uh, way to do it. I came up with working to have uh, a directory and everything executable, and there is a hook. But that's harder to explain to you that. Yes, I agree on that one. That's actually a nicer idea. Basically, in the jails directory, not the config file, you can have, let's say, add user dot hook dot sh, or I don't know, uh, reset admin dot hook dot sh, and you you know we can just ls these files and execute them, and the file itself should know what to do. Like, okay, I'm in this directory, so we assume this is the GL config with the same name, and that should be the GL name that's running. Check if it's running. You know, it, it could be a nicer interface. I'm thinking integrating something like um, RC sub R in that feature. You know, what is a hook? Well, it's it's something that sources user local uh, lib jailer hooks dot sh, you know, similar to what RC sub R does. You know, you, you, you hook it, then you define some variables or functions or whatever, and then jailer will do the rest for you again. But it's against our philosophy to intervene in that. Like what, what will happen if you do PKG remove jailer? The whole idea is that if you do PKG remove jailer, your jail should still continue to work. But in this case, all your jails will work, but your hooks are not gonna. So, <laughs> so that's also kind of an idea to to tinker around in there. Um, one of the one of the uh, from our perspective, my, my colleagues have been telling me that hey, let's leave jailer as is. Don't add features. Just make make it basically mcjail, but with more Dockery syntax, and you know that can do a little, a little, just a little bit more, but not too many. And then create a whole new jailer management system that is supposed to do. Uh, that is supposed to just replace the jail utility completely. Um, but but again, I, I, I'm not sure how I want to go into that deep parts of the code and, you know, rewrite, kind of rewrite, uh, jail uh, utility with a um, the UCL configuration file syntax, because that's that's the one that we've we've been liking the most. And this is after you created a, a Lua based front end simply because you can bang against the API because it's an API. Eh? Yes. And my team got the Lua part on scale and we didn't like it uh, just because it doesn't scale that well. Uh, not that it's bad, it's it's okay, you know, but on a, not, not on like a cloud scale. You know, it's okay for a home server scale, that's for sure, but not on a cloud scale. Um, and for that, they've been thinking, since we have a proper Oberon compiler in ports, uh, we can use Oberon. And now we already have Oberon um, UCL library that works with FreeBSD, an Oberon jail library that works with FreeBSD, and an Oberon libxl library that works with FreeBSD. So, you know, now we got the you know three main things that a jail manager should ever need. The problem is that I guess in the whole FreeBSD community, me and my colleague are the only people who know Oberon. So <laughs> even if we write this, I'm not, I don't think many Pascal people are going to come and contribute to that. You know, compared to Shell or Lua or whatever. So anyway, that, that's that's a very jailery story more than a jail story. Anything else on Jan's idea?
like hooks.d as a, a maybe a simpler implementation or otherwise. Jamie, I don't think you needed more food for thought, but here is a great dosage of food for thought. <laughs> oh, um, I, I, I have a thought, because yes. I've been playing around with Illumos, yes. our good neighbors, and uh, oh boy, am I loving it, um, especially the DLADM, uh, just DLADM and the whole crossbow thing is, is completely phenomenal, like the fact that you can create, um, uh, what do you call that, a virtual nix of a physical card as much as you want and pass them to a zone, you know, there without any of the concepts of bridging and e pairs and all of that is just really good. So, but all of that aside, one of the things I did notice is that, well, the zone ADM command, as well as the zone CF, uh, G command, zone administrator, zone, zone configuration, they are old, like um, Sun Microsystems old. And they use th something I love, which is XML, but people don't like XML usually, at least if they are sane. So um, uh, what did the community do? Well, they kept these tools and they do still work on them. It's not like they ignore these two utilities, which are a uh, core part of the Illumos uh, variants. Instead, they create another abstraction on top of it called ZADM, Z -A -D -M, uh, which brings all the nice, tiny little things that a user might want. For example, automatic creation of Vnix. In our case, it's automatic creation of um uh, e pairs they also added uh, json support right because the old ones were using xml and weird syntax files so i've been thinking that um it would it might be a good idea to do the bare minimum that we need to do in the jail utility like just the bare minimum and then have another like i don't know j adam utility in base which can be everything that every jail manager has ever wanted you know, not as a Docker alternative, like with hooks and this and that, but more like, hey, like this is 80% of all the things that we've all of us been doing. And the reason why we are not bringing it to the jail utility is because, well, the jail utility does have some good amount of legacy and backward compatibility and this and that. We will not touch those things. Instead, we will bring it to a new utility, which will be in base. And we can, you know, um, uh, beta tested as a port initially, just like we did with, I'm guessing Beehive was had a port. Not really. No. no. But... The, the, oh no no the, the current GL utility was a port in, back in uh, I think. Gen two. Yeah. Two? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So th that's I think it might be a good time to have a whole new utility which can call the old utility. I mean you know so. Um, uh, uh, I, th I think that's absolutely fine. Replacing might be tough because there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, it has to be bug to bug compliant, I think, as they say. So th that might be kind of tough. But this model might be easier. And I'm guessing all of us can hack on it anyway. Like it, it could end up being a, a weekend project, you know, if we do a weekend long hackathon. Anna, um, any thoughts on that? If Jamie and Mecca and Anyone else who works on GL managers and such. We also can bring, you know, ePair and NetGraph to be a tier one uh, class citizen instead of, uh, you know, just a couple of orgs in there. So I'm, I'm guessing there is a lot more place to play around with it. I prefer something with lots of features like that to remain in ports. To remain it, in ports? Yes, there's just, there's too much movement in what people want when you start to say yeah here's here's all the great things we can do that's that's kind of a ports philosophy of you know that's that becomes more application than system fun thing though the z adam command is not in base in Illumos. like it, it doesn't get installed automatically the, um, the the operating system people themselves man manage it like as if you were the maintainer again of the JL2 utility, but uh, uh, it's not that it's like third party. It's like, oh, okay, it's, it's from this, similar to Poudrier, you know, like Poudrier is, doesn't ship with FreeBSD, but it's part of the FreeBSD project, kind of. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's also a good idea to have it as a port, but yeah, so that's that's my idea.
Anyways, but I'm I'm absolutely loving it. I think I hope uh, it would be awesome if we could like throw some money at some network developers and tell them, hey, can we create crossbow for FreeBSD? That that would be um, a, a whole different level, other level of networking stack that mm. we can have. You have yet another yeah. virtual network stack for FreeBSD. No, no, um, actually, no, that's, no, that's no, the no, 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 that's yes, not okay. the idea. Good, thank you. DL Adam is a it's a management the driver from the IFP. It yeah, and, and, and another between. another Well, if I may, we are gonna use package base anyway, so who cares if it's based on packages? <laughs> uh, another well, one fun thing one that I, I can... No, I just want to say that there was another thing that I'm loving in, in Illumos variants, which I think FreeBSD really, really, really lacks. Actually, any other operating system as well, um, is that they have this utility called um, IP ADM, IP administration, which is an abstraction on top of ifconfig. So instead of like, for, let's say you're playing around with your network, just like I was like 10 minutes ago. And apparently my video was on and you all saw me, you know, running around, I guess. Then I noticed that, oh my God, my video is on. So, you know, I'm playing around, let's say I'm creating a bridge, attaching interfaces, removing interfaces, blah, blah, blah. Then I got the network that I want. Okay. How do I convert this to RCConf? You know, like that's a whole other set of skills, apparently. Um, in Illumos, it's not that way. You do, you do, uh, uh, you use the DL Adam or the IP Adam command to, you know, configure your networking. And when you're adding an IP, removing an IP, adding something to removing, it's always persistent, right? You can the, the default is persistent. The non-default is temporary. Having it to be only persistent is a terrible idea, because no, it no, means it's, that the, the default the is persistent. Mistake, it's permanent. Yeah. Yeah. Now, here's another fun part that I liked. So in, in the same problem set that I was trying to fix, you're playing around with a temporary. And as soon as you're done, you say, even with the temporaries that I have, whatever I have, now dump those into the persistent memory. And you're not managing RC bunch of, you know, if config on underscore IGB zeros anymore, right? Now you have a persistent configuration file, which is not supposed to be parsed. For that, they have XML apparently. <laughs> So yeah, uh, th 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 that's also a very nice network abstraction layer that we can use, especially if we have like e pairs and bridges and and um, you know we have VLANs and whatnot. Uh, it could it it can actually be a shell script basically, uh, with the whole idea that users are not supposed to touch etc rc dot ip or whatever, right? So uh, that could be a very nice uh, weekend project as well to have a prototype that does persistent network configuration. Um, and, and it's, it's very, very neat the way that they have it, uh, I guess. And again, another thing that we can, I guess, learn from them, which does apply very much on GLs. Um, so that was also very interesting to see. Uh, is that a state tracking question oh, yeah. such that if you have that state slamming it out to persistence is quite easy? No. Okay. It's, how do you get from running configuration losslessly back to the way you created it? The problem right now, for example, is that uh, rcconf is shell script. So uh, it's not just still data. It is uh, really arbitrary shell code can go into rc.conf. So uh, you can't really losslessly take the running configuration and restore it back unless you basically have a way to compute the difference and then you get into really nasty problems about how do you map that back and forth. Cool. And maybe Jan, you've got the background noise. Anyhow, uh, we've covered a lot of territory. That's all very exciting. And I'll just throw in that the Friday hackathon went quite well and has lots of puns that you are welcome to read at your leisure. I have them in the doc at the top there. And I'll paste the link to the chat. So uh, weird. Just quickly, yeah, Chris, with one last remark. Uh, the conversation about putting things into ports or into base, uh, I just want to remind you guys about a topic that also um, evolved out of the uh, 
uh, Enterprise Working Group, which was basically this originating problem statement that the support for the different ports that we have in terms of jails and BIOC management, that usually there is only one maintainer and that is causing the usual problem loop that, you know, support is either slow or things are not getting developed at the pace that people would usually hope for. And um, this is where originally also Michael Ozipov was coming from that basically he was hoping for something to be moved into base, which obviously we all know that this is not as easy as it sounds. So I'm wondering, I mean, there's a bunch of really great ideas and there's a lot of tooling around. I'm wondering whether there's any ways uh, whether there's any way to uh, bring people to, let's say, a, a, a sort of a, I don't even know how to call it. It's, um, it's if I think if I think about EF config because we had lip IF config previously. I mean, obviously, lip IF config is a great idea because it allows many people to develop on on, on the functionality of IF config. So I'm wondering. Is there is there a tool set that we can all agree on? Um, and just like like Jan started, you know, a schema that we can all agree on, and we build a, a, a library for that, and 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 then anyone can develop on top of that. Is that even feasible? I don't know. And I mean, it's a very generic, very broad, probably philosophical question. I understand that. Well, that's uh, actually the a comment. Hand, there um, includes descriptors. Hook so my. Well, we're we're putting in it, that plumbing to get there and when we do have agreement so uh it's unfortunate but this perhaps is what it looks like <laughs> or use alumas and they've solved all problems decades ago yeah all right yeah i wish there were really a more low-hanging fruit short paths to these things uh and i'm happy to be wrong on that statement <sighs> Other feedback to Chris's point there that well, what does our our sort of heavier lifting, fewer choices in base fundamentals look like so that if Illumos has the Illumos way, FreeBSD has the FreeBSD way, and while there might be a, some small casualties in the in the road forward for some of the existing management utilities, what does the common plumbing look like? Are we getting there? And I'm that's just, I can just jump wondering to the whether, if you like, go ahead. I'm I'm just wondering whether there's you know there's this one extreme of having something like GADM that Andrew mentioned, and the opposite side of building something completely full featured, where nobody's gonna be happy anyways because they want this one slight thing different, you know, and then they build their own stuff. Um, well, size fits none. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I hear so you. So I, I like I like I like both ideas of this JADM that built something on top of the existing tooling and and having something like Jan uh, built out that basically have a schema that at the end of the day still compiles into a format that can be or is found in base. So we're not taking any anything away uh, from the existing tooling. Network. I'm wondering whether that okay. is a better approach. You know? but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I'll just throw this out there. Netlink keeps coming up. Is there a little to-do list on just what's missing there to round that out? Uh, to maybe you know kick some overhead to it rather than into jail itself or otherwise? I mean, uh, well, I have one question about Netlink because the, you, as soon as you guys mentioned that, I I, I attempted to you know research. Uh, research is an overstatement. I was googling around for for some sample code. And um, I have to say the documentation, but I guess the same applies for lipif config because I also looked at lipif config. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can look at the code, but there is no man page, there is nothing. And yes, it's still an internal library. Um, so it's not even, it's not private, it's, it's less than private, yeah. Just like Jan mentioned. 
documentation, documentation, documentation. And that keeps coming up. And hello, Foundation. You're welcome to help there. If it's a question of documentation <laughs> yeah. hackathons, that's, a very that's good actually point, that, that is was a very good point. Well, that that was actually how the last week's discussion that led to talk of a hackathon began began. It was like, okay, let's look at the uh net graph and other things. And thank you, Daniel. I will show you the beautiful picture while he's still on the call. I will as this slowly loads. So one here, the slogans are about 15 slogans and puns for t-shirts that are, yeah, downright terrible. I, I'm proud of that. So slowly loading. We got into NetGraph. He gave some great syntax here. I will zoom in and then brace for it. Uh, first, there's some excellent like real-time docs he punched in there. And then there are some beautiful images here, as I recall. Boom. So yes, this is the kind of production use real world documentation sanitized with you know client names removed that we need to slowly work into official documentation so thank you daniel for that and chris yes yes i hear you that's this is Good what question. it often looks like and then the little yeah, yeah indeed and the little gotchas like you know you know get it wrong and it'll bite you in the somewhere so thank you thank you thank you uh, that segued into loading, loading, loading. Uh, uses of cloud init images. Anshanig was battling with NFS v3 and 4 and a Linux VM. And uh, it sounds like Ubuntu LTS might be less than satisfactory given that it was having plenty of NFS issues. Uh, we talked snapshotting and uh, Zelta with Daniel also. Thank you, Daniel, once again. Andrenig was having plenty of challenges. Uh, NetMap is statically linked. Interesting. Talk GPUs briefly. Uh, Andrenig sort of limits there. PA memory handling and you name it. Why did he only see a terabyte of RAM under uh, UEFI rather than, rather than Grub Loader? That is not a jail question. Uh, network tuning, Rod gave us some great feedback on matching your, uh, like, uh, ba -ba. oh gosh, frame size was it, and congestion control, and it looks like 14 has some more 10 gig friendly defaults, so you can read the math here we did, that was very, very cool. And I shared, while well, this is not jail, uh, all my discoveries on booting a whole bunch of virtual machine, oh, uh, with OS, virtual machines with different OSs and quite a few worked. I was very pleasantly surprised that uh, uh, Android and uh, all the Illumos, Illumoses beyond uh, OmniOS were super easy right out of the gate. And then here are the puns if you want to just uh, do a very quick look at those at your leisure. So we are at a, just past a moose jaw, an hour and a half meeting. Anything else? If not, Jamie, have a fantastic uh, sabbatical, if you will, if you want the most polite spin there. And I very much look forward to your, your code on. It's the... more like two or three months in hell, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you said it, not me. Uh, and it sounds like you've been in, um, unpaid hill. This is volunteer work. Okay, cool. <laughs> it's perhaps you're helping out your local organizations. Uh, anything else? If not, I'm going to call it. I can stick around a few minutes. Uh, Chris, if you've got news on your supervisor, that might be a jail thing. But uh, having missed you this last few calls, I'd love to hear where you're at. And if we're good, we're, you know. Good. And I'll put us down for the what what day is this? 22nd for the 29th. Anyway. Thank you everyone. Have a great week. And uh put a I'll bit into a chat because it was quite noisy. See you for a moment. Okay, cool. Well take care everyone. I'll stop the recording. Like and subscribe. Ah you beat him to it. I oh, love it. Ha, ha, ha.